I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting CapitalAllocatorsPodcast.com. Ted Sides is the Managing Director of Hiddenbrook Investments, LLC. All opinions expressed by Ted and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Hiddenbrook Investments. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of Hiddenbrook Investments may maintain positions and securities or managers discussed on this podcast. Charlie Munger is well known for preaching the importance of interdisciplinary knowledge in the practice of investing. His insight resonates with me, but I've never been one to find the time to read broadly and deeply into arcane works on other subjects. I've always just loved digesting the art and science of investing. That said, this podcast platform offers an opportunity to explore a range of different disciplines in a time-efficient manner. I've long been intrigued by the great people I've met who have served our country in the armed forces, and I've been particularly impressed by their leadership qualities and discipline. I thought it would be fun to dive into some lessons with one of the most extraordinary individuals I know among the mix. My guest on today's show is David Gerfine, whose nickname, Bull, fits the bill. Bull is a decorated Marine Corps combat veteran. He drove tanks and was an honor graduate from Officer Candidate School while attending Syracuse University. Upon graduation from college, Bull accepted a commission as a Marine Second Lieutenant. Over the subsequent 11 years, he served as a combat infantry officer, leading Marines in the jungles of Panama, the deserts of Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, and on the fence line at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. He left active duty to earn his MBA at Harvard in 2000, where he was the co-president of his class. Bull started a business career after graduate school. However, when the U.S. was attacked on 9-11, Bull voluntarily returned to active duty. He saw combat action in Afghanistan and Iraq and served as a congressional liaison for the Supreme Allied Commander Europe and the Special Operations Command. With a daughter on the way and 25 years of service under his belt, Bull retired as a lieutenant colonel. Since then, he has applied his leadership and management experience to the business world, focusing on organizational design and business development. His leadership training program, entitled Whoop Ass, has positively impacted startups and Fortune 500 companies alike. Oh, and he took a break from all that in 2016 to run for U.S. Congress. Despite his vast accomplishments, most who meet Bull are particularly intrigued by his very brief cinematic career. Our conversation discusses principles of leadership, management, and resource allocation, alongside colorful stories of successes and failures. Bull's frameworks have clear applicability to anyone overseeing an investment process. This was one of my favorite conversations so far in Capital Allocators, and I hope you agree. Please enjoy my conversation with David Bull Gerfine. It is so great to have you on the show. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Ted. Awesome. It's uh, you know great to reconnect. Always. This is going to be a lot of fun. And even though most of the people listening don't know who you are, the vast majority have seen you before. They just don't quite realize it. So I'm gonna give that little story and we'll go from there. You are literally out of central casting. And what I mean by that is, if you were in front of me, you would see, Bull, you are 6'2", burly chest, square jaw, blue eyes, short crop black hair. And in fact, you're so out of central casting that now, what, 25 years ago, the producers of A Few Good Men tapped you for a famous courtroom scene where those who are listening might remember you were one of the people that restrained Jack Nicholson playing Colonel Jessup when he lunged for Tom Cruise. And I I think the line was something like, I'm going to rip your eyes out and piss in your dead skull as he was saying that. (laughs) So people have seen you before. And I, I would just love to circle back. You were from Long Island and went to the military. And what was your thought process at age 17 when you decided to enlist? 
Well, thanks, Ted. I appreciate you asking. So the, uh, you know, I guess to put things in perspective, um, you, know, you we, we are sort of a culmination of our upbringing. And my mother and father were both very service oriented. My uh, father was a United States Marine during World War II. And uh, he was actually a uh, a very prominent figure in New York in that he was the captain of an NIT championship basketball team. Everybody knew who he was. And when he enlisted in the Marines, it uh, got a full page uh, spread with tons of photographs, Art Gerfine off to fight the war. And so uh, he, he didn't necessarily have to go, but he wanted to go and he recognized how to leverage his popularity to gain support. And so he went and served and my mother was serving as well, but in England at the time and she was a nurse. And so both of them have always sort of put into me the whole perspective of spirit of service and, uh, as we refer to it, noblesse oblige, that, you know, if you have the ability, you have an obligation to serve. And so when I was 17, I cut out of high school <laughs> and ran down the recruiter and said, uh, hey, you know, how, how do you uh, – how do you join the Marines? And the recruiter told me the whole story of, you know, what you have to do. And he said, you know, do you do drugs? I said, no, I don't, I don't do drugs. He's like, are, are you in good shape? I said, yeah, you know, I'm captain football, wrestling, lacrosse teams. And he's like, all right, well, you're going to graduate high school. I said, I, I think so. I think I'm going to graduate. <laughs> and so he said, uh, all right. He goes, well, we could enlist you today. I said, what you enlist me today? He goes, yeah, well, we'll have to get your parents' signature, but, you know, we can start the paperwork today. I said, wow. I said, I, I don't think my dad is going to have a problem with that. But, you know, my mom might question it. But I said, before we get started, you know, I, my parents have always made me, you know, work for everything that I've ever done. So, and I just need to know how much is this going to cost? He said, excuse me? I said, yeah, how much am I going to have to pay to join the Marines? He goes, no, no, we pay you. I said, come on, look, I know I'm a young kid, but don't screw with me. Like, you're going to pay me to be a Marine? He's like, are you sure you don't do drugs? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was sort of the beginning of my Marine Corps career. Uh, I couldn't wait to join him. Uh, I enlisted and then later became an officer and uh, went on to serve 25 years uh, through active and uh, reserve time. And, uh, you know, just loved everything I, I gained from it and loved every interaction and every person I met. And it was just a great experience. So we met when you were, I guess you had probably been in 12, 13 years, right, when you left to go to, to graduate school. Correct. And so in that period of time, you go from knowing nothing to leading people, leading teams, learning a tremendous amount. And as we've talked about, the so many of the people that we know in common from school that had that background have a similar leadership training. And then in, in my world, my old world in asset management, you certainly don't see the same type of managerial expertise and leadership. And I was wondering if you could share a little bit, either through stories or just some of the lessons that you've learned in leadership that allowed you and those that have had similar training to sort of have a certain knowledge about how to guide others? Yeah, Ted, that's that's a great question. And I, I do a lot of consulting right now where I try to bring in a lot of the lessons learned and best practices that uh, the Marine Corps has instituted. And, you know, a lot of times when people think of Marine Corps leadership, they think of like some drill instructor yelling in your face and they think that's what leadership is. But it, that's not. And, you know, a drill instructor has a specific purpose and their purpose is to stress people out and to see how people will handle themselves under stress. And that's where this boot camp screening process, they have a job. But that's not leadership and it's not the style of, uh, of leadership that we have in the Marine Corps, because the reality is if you're in a combat environment, and you're screaming at someone to do something, and they're in a nice, safe, covered, concealed position, they're not going to do anything if they don't trust your leadership. And so the reality is that that leadership has to be developed over time. It's a trust. It's a, it's a bond. It's communication to where there is no there's no reason to scream and yell at somebody to do something. You just point, and they know that you're going to be covering them and that everything's going to work out and the mission will be accomplished. So where does that all begin? What's interesting is... Marine Corps leadership development begins before you even head out to boot camp, before you even in, are on the yellow footprints down in Paris Island, you start learning what's called leadership traits and leadership principles. And as you're learning these things, 
you're, you're sort of thinking to yourself, well, when the heck am I ever going to be leading anything? I'm going in to be a private in the Marine Corps. Like, there's going to be corporals and sergeants, everybody telling me what to do. But the Marine Corps recognized that once you graduate Paris Island and you go on to be a Marine out in the fleet Marine Force, you could immediately go into a combat situation. I, ideally, you will have gone through your basic warrior training first, and then your leaders could be taken out, injured, killed, removed for whatever reason, and now all of a sudden, hey, Ted, you're in charge. <laughs> all of a sudden, you can't, it's not like in the civilian world where we say, all right, we're going to send you back for some sort of leadership training. We're going to send you some management school, or we're going to get some consultant here. You're, you're on the spot. So all of a sudden, you fall back on these leadership traits, these leadership principles, the, the basics of formulating plans and understanding how to give orders. I mean, all of those things start before you even join. And so you're ready, even though you don't realize you're ready. Moreover, the Marine Corps has a perspective that whenever t- even two people are given a task, one person is always the leader and is responsible. And this is where a lot of times I've worked with managers who are great, who are saying, hey, everybody, I need you all to get out there and do X. And when you task everyone, you task no one. And so this is where there is always one individual who's held accountable and says, hey, Ted, you're in charge. Even though you may be a day senior to the person that you're in charge of, you're going to be the one when he comes back and say, hey, why wasn't this done? And you can't say, oh, well, you know what? Bull didn't do it. <laughs> no, Ted, I held you accountable. And so you're responsible for it getting done. Now, what's interesting is. There are some secondary and tertiary effects to developing leadership in our subordinates. The first is that they take ownership of the organization. So when they come into the organization believing that they are leaders, and we do, we are Marines. This is our Marine Corps. It's not, hey, you know what, I'm a cook that's working for the Marine Corporation, and it, it's not a me anymore. It's This is my organization. So if something's messed up. If there's a, a, a you know even some cigarette butts laying around, I have to clean that up or get make sure it gets cleaned up because it's a disgrace on my Marine Corps. And you ask any Marine, you know, so what do you do? They say, I'm a Marine. And they don't talk about what their job is. You can say, well, what do you do in the Marine Corps? Oh, I'm a machine gunner. I fly jets. I do what? But at first, you're a Marine. So there's association with the organization first. I remember a concept in in college, for example, called, uh, I think it was like an intro psychology, diffusion of responsibility. I used to talk about it with my team. If you send an email out to three people asking for something, nobody ever sends it back. Or you sort of have to assign ownership. Same same kind of concept. And so do you see that repeatedly in the organizations you're working with where there just, there isn't the sense of ownership? Absolutely. And and I think most people um, have jobs. Most people, uh, it's it's not something that's a profession. Um, they're that they're they're pe- figuring out how they're going to pay the mortgage, and so there's also a different sense of loyalty to the organization and to the individuals that they work for. But again, a part of that is the way that the leadership has set up their own perspective, and one one of the analogies I try to give, you know, we all think of leadership as sort of this pyramid and the org chart where you have the senior leaders up top and everything flows down. The Marine Corps has a very different perspective. And the perspective is really that of an inverted pyramid in that the leader is actually at the bottom trying to balance everything because at the end of the day for success, that 18-year-old rifleman must locate, close with, and destroy the enemy. And if that doesn't happen, nothing else matters. So everything in the organization exists to support that individual. Whereas in the corporate world, a lot of times we see individuals who are moving up the leadership channels. They see subordinates as trying to affect their accomplish missions for them to get a good resume or them to build so they can go to the next level. And so they're stepping on people and not really caring about their personal welfare. And this is where the Marine Corps perspective is there's two competing principles. One is mission accomplishment, which must always come first, but an extremely close second is troop welfare. And you're constantly looking out for the betterment of those troops. And there's a lot of organizations out in the civilian world that do this. And you may recall that we had Richard Branson who came and spoke at Harvard Business School. And he got up here and he said, you know, what is the most important thing in a retail organization? And everybody said, oh, the customer is always right. And he said, wrong. 
<laughs> he goes, your employees are always right. And the perspective he went on to share was that if we support our employees and we have them, we train them properly and we give them the tools and we give them the backing and the support that they will do the right thing by the customer. And the, they understand the organization is backing him. And I think that his success in various different industries, you know, bears out this point that focus on looking out for those employees and give them the tools to do the right thing to accomplish the mission. Yeah. So one of the things you touched on, and you just went through it, but I want to circle back to it, is the notion of making plans and then giving orders and how you give orders. So let's start with the second one. If you start with this construct of, hey, the employees are the people that matter, the bottom of the pyramid is what works, how do you, how do you give orders in such a way that supports that thought process? That's a great question. I think the, the, the first piece is the communication. And it has to be a two-way communication. And the first thing that I always do whenever I step into an organization, whether as a a CEO or as a a consultant or in any form of leadership role, whether it be a combat unit or whether it be in civilian private sector, I ask three questions of every single person in that organization. What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? And what can we be doing better? I call them the good, the bad, and the ugly. Tell me the good things. And people come out, a lot of times they don't think about because we get focused on all the things that we, we bitch about and we're upset about. So people first identify, well, we're doing these things really well. Great. Let's keep doing that. What's the bad stuff? Oh, we're doing that? Let's get rid of that. Now, what are the things we can do better? Because there's some things we should be doing and we're not doing for whatever reason. And then this is really where we find those solutions. And so bringing this back in and then coming out with directives and orders that people want to hear. I mean, this is the thing. Down on the, you know, for all of us who have been working down at the, the subordinate level, we know who the crummy players are long before the management ever finds out. And this is where, you know, we're, we're not looking for tattletales, but we're looking for a, a structure that's going to allow us for support and to weed out that weakness. So a lot of it is just listening, spending that time listening and then crafting plans and prioritizing that which is most important. And this is something where I see a lot of junior leaders have trouble doing because they perceive everything is important. We have to do everything. And all of a sudden we throw this giant weight on our subordinates to say get everything done. And then when the thing that is most important isn't getting done, we get upset. And this is where I would say 99% of the time we don't have bad employees. We have horrible leadership. And we don't supervise and we don't provide support. We throw something out. We expect it to get done. We come back two weeks later and say, why isn't it done? Instead of saying, hey, here's the things we have to get done. Are you going to can you perceive any problems that you're going to have getting that done? Well, I don't have this and I could use that. And maybe we could have some more time for that. And this time frame, you know, you've asked me to do these other things, which is more important. And so being able to listen to that and not be like, oh, my gosh, why are they always complaining? But realizing that's our job is to manage people's time, to give them the ability to be successful. And then all of a sudden, the, by prioritizing, developing clear guidelines and, pl- and plans, timelines with milestones and objectives, everything starts getting done. And then there seems, there seems to be a sense of of enthusiasm that, wow, we're accomplishing things and we're moving forward and that momentum grows throughout the organization and you can get bigger and bigger things done to where now you can give the more challenging tasks. The other big thing is that we we don't pay a lot of respect to people's overtime or their weekends and we dismiss their family time. And it's like, hey, that sounds like a personal issue. You know, especially the closer you get to Wall Street, the less personal time you're expected to have. And you have to understand you can't keep surging all the time because eventually people are going to break. And when that opportunity to move comes, they're going to move. And it's going to happen just when you don't want them to move. So being considerate and respectful of people's personal time and trying to manage that uh, is one of those things where most subordinate leaders, we, we we sort of give up our own personal time, so we expect everybody else to do it. And I think that that's, a, that's something where when you give the orders by being perce- perceptive and uh, empathetic, you'll get a much greater response. Can you talk a little bit about wi- learning by through mistakes? So when you get into the military, it's already a machine. 
you're put into this machine, all of these things are already in place, and yet somewhere along the way, things don't work out. So maybe tell a few stories of how you learned from seeing things not done in this kind of framework that makes a ton of sense and everyone should say, yeah, that's great. We'll just, we have all the time in the world and we'll manage people and we'll manage money or whatever we need to do to get the job done. And we'll change this around a little bit so our junior people are supported, but somewhere along the way it breaks down. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting that you asked that And there's, there's two different Marine Corps. There is the peacetime Marine Corps where everything is sort of moving in clockwork, everything is just by design, and everybody knows exactly how we should be doing everything. It's sort of like a well-established corporation. And then there's combat. And combat is totally different. This is the entrepreneurial world, because now you're dealing with the most volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environments that you could possibly imagine. And regardless of how great your plans are, well, guess what? The enemy always gets a vote. And the, the enemy's plan is never going to work out exactly as you had expected it. So this is where there's a transition period where those people who tend to be great in the the bureaucratic world of a peacetime Marine Corps end up not adjusting well to this, this free-flowing environment. And those people who are great in the combat environment sometimes don't fit that well in the structure of a peacetime Marine Corps. And, and I'll give you a, you know, a personal experience is that we, one of the things we do in the Marine Corps is we understand in combat that there's going to be volatility and that we're not, our plans aren't going to work out perfectly. As a matter of fact, we write these huge plans and we recognize the second the first round is fired, that plan is obsolete. So we give a lot of mission-oriented statements, and what we do is we provide the vision. The vision is called the commander's intent. And so the commander you know, basically says, hey, our mission is who, what, where, when, why. And then here's the commander's intent. And it's basically this is the purpose of why we're doing this. And this is the method in which we would like to see it get done. But most importantly, this is the end state. So at the end of the day, at the end of the week, at the end of the month, this is what I perceive everything will look like. Now, I recognize that. My plan to get there may not work, but you on the ground there, you're going to figure out how to make sure we get to that end state because you will know better than I do. Because me as the commander, I think I know everything, but I don't. And you will because you'll be able to see this. And so one of the interesting things was as I was one of the lead Marines going into Iraq during the Operation Iraqi Freedom, I had a special operations task force. And my responsibility was to open up what we call the shoulders, clear all the barriers and make sure that everything was opened up for the shock and awe attack for 7th Marines to dive deep into the country. And uh, part of my, my, I had very explicit orders on, on how to accomplish that mission. But I also was given the commander's intent, and it was basically ensure that the people recognized that we were there to support them, not to harm them. No better friend, no worse enemy. And so we had to think of creative ways to communicate that. And there was no real way of thinking this through ahead of time, but it just had to be the mindset. And the mindset that I always gave to my Marines was to do no harm. If, if possible, do not destroy a building. Do not destroy a car. Do not destroy a tree. Don't kill an animal. Don't kill a human being. If you don't have to, don't. Try to figure out ways to be creative to accomplish a mission without destruction. And we were very successful in doing that. And one of the things that we did was as we were communicating with the people that I had these these women would they would. It, what's interesting is on the battlefield, it, it's not clean. It's not like the British and the Americans standing against each other firing. You have everybody running in all different directions. And then you have these non-combatants and these children, and these dogs and everything running in between and in and out and people watching everything you do. And one of the things that I didn't do was I didn't shoot a child who was picking up a rocket-propelled grenade one time right to my flank, and I drew down on them, and I screamed at him. And what was nice is that uh, <laughs> profanity actually translates very well across all cultures. <laughs> I, I screamed at this kid. He dropped the weapon and ran away. It, to me, it really didn't have that tremendous of an impact, but later on when the, when the fighting sub subdued, this woman dragged this kid out by his ear and was yelling at the kid while he, she was talking to me. And through my translator, she basically was thanking me for not shooting her stupid kid. 
And she said that the Iraqi military would not have been so kind. They wouldn't have, have given the second thought. And the fact that my mil- my Marines were so compassionate, the people auto- quickly started coming to our side to provide us support and to help us with our mission. And one of the things they pointed out was that, you know, we had to watch out because Saddam Hussein was everywhere, watching everything, and that he'll never go away. And we explained to her, look, America would not send her United States Marines all the way this far into the country without this. And so one of the, the, the visual symbols was this giant, these giant posters everywhere of Saddam Hussein. And uh, I turned to my interpreter. I said, look, tell everybody to tear these posters down. And he told them and they refused. They were terrified. And they told the story of a young child who was shot in the face for even throwing mud on one of these posters once. So I said, that's it. I told my Marines, tear them all down. And they said, sir, look, there's still snipers and everybody around here. Like, I think we can wait a day or two. I said, no, they're coming down now. So I went up. I started tearing down all these posters of Saddam Hussein. And the people were just looking at me like, oh, my gosh, this guy's crazy. And slowly, though, they started coming out and chanting and cheering. And we started gaining the support of the locals. Of course, the media came in. They videotaped it. They took photographs of it. It was on the there was a daily news or the post. Or, I know you ended up somewhere on the one of the New York papers. It was, it was on the front page cover of every newspaper across the world. My brother in Israel picked up a newspaper and saw it. Was like, what the heck? And the communication that came out was America here is to remove Saddam Hussein, not to harm the Iraqi people. And that spread throughout the Arab world and was a very positive message. Now, your question was about failure. So the interesting thing is we have a saying in the Marine Corps, no good deed goes unpunished. So after that incident, I collected up some of our uh, the senior officers that we captured and our uh, some of the classified information, all the rest. And we went back to the, the rear command, which was still in Kuwait. And we came in, everybody's cheering. Everybody saw what happened. Of course, some colonel who has, was not able to make that shift from the bureaucratic world into the combat world pulls me into his office, which was just sort of like a partitioned area of this giant airplane hangar, and proceeds to start screaming at me, like, that was not your mission. Who told you to do that? You were in the, on CNN. You were in the news. Who told you about it? Just screaming and yelling because there was nothing written about doing that. That was my interpretation of the commander's intent. Now, fortunately, one of the, the Marines who was outside, because they were all listening, they all turned down the radios to listen to this major getting his butt chewed, decides to call up to the commanding general, General Conway, a brilliant, brilliant officer, who had already jumped forward with his command and said, uh, told the general to call back. The general called for the colonel, and he goes, and the colonel, you know, you've got the general on the line for you, picks up the line, and he tells me just to stay right there. He goes, yes, sir. No, we, yes, sir, he's right here. Abs- yes, sir, I saw all that on TV, and I got to, well, well, yes, sir. No, that was great initiative on his part. Yes, sir. We, we will tell all units in country to tear down all posters, all statues of Saddam Hussein. And it was because General Conway got it. He understood the message that was being communicated, whereas this other individual did not understand. And this colonel, was he told me to turn in my weapons. He was ready to throw me out of the country. Fortunately, I was saved by the bell with this general, who then put me into doing more special ops throughout the country. So I guess the lesson learned is you do the right thing at the right time for the right reasons. And be able to communicate why you've done all of that. Well, there is something, uh, as you described it, to that notion of intent where you have a situation where your, I guess, commanding officer had said, here, our intent as you're clearing out these shoulders is to you know, take care of the people. You interpret it one way. Someone else interprets it a different way, very different way. And in this case, it worked out brilliantly for everyone involved. How about what happens when it when it doesn't happen? So you're in the same kind of situation. You do that. One of the guys on your team does it. He gets shot in the leg. Um, And how do you then reinforce the what what the intent is or in that case, what the mission is to sort of redirect? And as you as the leader. Do people then start to question your leadership if you take that risk or it's your interpretation and you make, you know, in the outcome is not what you would have liked? You know, you bring to mind two stories from the first Gulf War um, where I I made two calls, two command decisions, and uh, one played out well, one did not. The first one 
was uh, the, the Iraqis during the first Gulf War, when we were in Kuwait providing a secure position in Kuwait, decided to attack into the city of Kafchi, which is in Saudi Arabia. They had now expanded into another country. Our unit responded, and uh, along with another unit, and then we dug in. That night, we were uh, we had been up for, I don't know, 48 hours. Our Marines were tired. They were hungry, and we were digging into this one defensive position, and my platoon sergeant came and said, hey, sir, look, everybody's tired. We haven't eaten. Let's get everybody, just let them Go to sleep tonight, tomorrow morning, we'll dig in. And I said, no. And I was a young second lieutenant at the time, and I said, we, we dig in now because that's our standing operating procedure, and that's the right thing to do, and that's what I've learned from combat warriors before me. When you stop, you dig because that's the only thing that will protect you from indirect fire. And he said, look, the Iraqis are they are out of range of, of uh, with their artillery. They can't hit us. They don't have any air up. And I said, dig, and I started digging. And he went out, got the word out, being a good platoon sergeant. And he told everybody to start digging in, about 100 Marines or so, and they're all digging. And I could hear everybody bitching and cursing, and everybody hated me. And normally, at the end of the day, the platoon sergeant would always bring, bring me a cup of coffee, and we'd sit and talk. That evening, he did not, which was very clear he was upset with me. And I remember sitting down and, and turned to the radio operator and said, okay, go get some sleep. I'll take the first watch. And I, I'm sitting in my hole, and, you know, I was thinking, did I, did I make the wrong call? Like, wow, I really screwed up. And everybody's going to hate me. And now we're going into combat. And they, are they going to frag me? I mean, what? And then all of a sudden, shroom, we got strafed. We got 1,000-pound cluster bombs dropped on our position. The world just turned upside down. Dash 2 came through. Bombs going off. Everything's going everywhere. Shrapnel's flying over our positions. Long story short, no one was injured. We all survived because everybody was in their holes. And the next morning, they were down digging even deeper because once you get hit by indirect fire, that's a wake-up call. And the platoon sergeant came and brought me coffee that morning, which basically meant, all right, good call, lieutenant. So that one worked out well. But what if it hadn't? And so I'll give you the next situation was... Hey, Bo, before you jump into that, in those moments before the, the, the fire came in, were you starting to think about, okay, what am I going to say to the guys in the morning? I recognize there was nothing I was going to say, but it was one of those things where I knew or I perceived that my credibility was shot, that, you know, these guys just were not going to trust me. And whenever they could get away with something, they'd be like, you know, this lieutenant doesn't know what he's doing. He's doing things by the book. He's not doing the right things. And uh, I, I was really, I was questioning myself and I, I trusted in the leaders who had trained me, the mentors who had trained me, and I, I guess it was just luck <laughs> that we were strafed, I mean, if you can put it that way, because our, it created the cohesion and support of our unit. But I don't know that there would have been anything to say at that time. I think they, they recognized my position, and that was it. All right, so let's go to the failure story. Right, so the failure, then uh, one of the things we – we were a mortar platoon, and our job was to provide indirect fire, close-in indirect fire for our our uh, supported unit, which was the infantry line units. And the challenge was we had this old ammunition that hadn't been restocked in years. It was this, what's called 300 series ammo that we knew had a great uh, propensity to fall short. And that means we had to offset which made it really tough for us to support our advancing infantry because if it fell short, it could kill them. Friendly fire, fratricide. So we were desperate to get this new 800 series ammunition, and we kept being told, don't worry, it's coming. Don't worry, it's coming. And we'd been in the desert for several months, and it wasn't coming. And then we then were picked to be the lead battalion going into uh, Kuwait uh, to spearhead the attack into Kuwait, and we still had this old ammunition. And as we were repositioning, we came across this abandoned truck on the battlefield that was bringing resupplies up front, pre-positioning them, that had broken down and was full of this 800 series ammo. So I immediately tried getting on the radios, contacted my commanders, no communication. What now, Lieutenant? What do you do? Do you leave that ammunition unsecured on the battlefield and move up to this attack position, knowing that within days you're going to be a part of the lead unit attacking? Or do you take this ammunition? What do you do? Or, or do you, or I guess there was a third option. Do you leave security on there, breaking up your unit and hoping that nobody takes this abandoned ammunition? 
I made the call to unload every piece of ammunition, load it up onto our vehicles and bring it up with us. And as we got up, it was uh, right at uh, what we call ENT, end of evening nautical twilight. The sun was setting and I immediately ordered my Marines set up all of our guns, prepare. We had heard that there might have been a, a, a preemptive strike coming against us. The Iraqis were going to get in, set up the guns, break out the new ammunition, get ready to fire. And we were all fired up. We had this new ammunition. We got all the guns up. Everything was ready. I talked to my executive officer. Uh, it was the second in command of our company. Told him what we did. He goes, great job. Make sure you tell the company commander as soon as you can. Very well. I will. Got the guns up. Everything was ready. And then we set in for the night. Nothing happened. The next morning, the company commander heard that I had stolen ammunition and brought me in to see the battalion commander. And uh, the word had gotten out from the highest ranks that anybody who was stealing our own goods from our supply camps would be relieved. The battalion commanders would be relieved. And so although I hadn't actually stolen anything, It was one of those things where the battalion commander just didn't want to get relieved and said, you know what, it's in my best interest not to take a chance. And so he relieved me. So I was fired from that position, which as one of those senior lieutenants was it had a shockwave throughout the organization. Uh, But the battalion commander decided to keep me within the battalion because he wanted my skill set and I still attacked with the battalion. But it was heartbreaking for me. And it it was a a failure in, in a sense and uh, it's one of those things where, again, I made what I felt was the right call and it was deemed as not the right call. And the you know, I look back on it. What could I have done better? Well, perhaps I could have made a better effort to communicate to the command ahead of time. And whether that would have made a difference, we don't know. But it's uh, it's one of those things where, again, you make the right and, and we end up advancing and attacking with the new ammunition. <laughs> My unit was highly successful, did exactly what they were supposed to do. And we didn't have any fratricide incidents. So in the end run, you know, it was a good call. And I sacrificed my position for that. So let's use that as an example. How does leadership in that situation make sure that you are not demotivated in your next task? Well, that's, that's great. The general rule within the Marine Corps is, and it's even written in our FMFM1 leadership, you know, warrior Bible, if you will, is that our subordinate leaders should never be punished for making a mistake. They should be counseled, they should be brought aside, but never punished because it does limit taking risk or chances or advancing going forward. And the only time that a subordinate should be punished is for a lack of action. Because in the Marine Corps, we have to have a propensity for action. And just as in an entrepreneurial organization, you can't have somebody come back and you say, hey, did you get X done? Well, well, no, because of this. Well, what did you do? Well, well, nothing. I, you can't do nothing. You must do something. Even if it's wrong, you have to do something. And this is where the, the momentum and, and everything can be stalled if you're crushing someone every time they make a mistake. So in general, you know, I've, I've had plenty of subordinates who've made mistakes. And certainly you have to correct it and pull them aside. And assuming it's not a criminal action or something that's, that's you know, a war crime. You just give them that rudder correction because that's how they learn and that's how they move forward. And then you you constantly, you know, we always have this saying, hey, good initiative, bad judgment. (laughs) So you want to keep reinforcing the initiative. But, hey, let's think this through a little bit better. And that's where being an active leader and manager is something where we don't see that a lot. And a lot of the organizations that I work with, especially the entrepreneurial organizations, where they, they just get frustrated. Somebody's made a mistake and all of a sudden they dismiss them. Or, it, you know, there's the cold shoulder or, or they fire them. And it's like, well, hold on a second. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. This is a great person. The fact that they made that mistake means they were tr- they were thinking they were trying to do something. But we as leaders didn't communicate clearly sort of the boundaries that were acceptable and the importance of the initiative. So it, it's it, it's a, something that develops over time. And it's something that starts at the top because a mid-level manager will destroy a subordinate because they're afraid of how the senior leadership is going to view them. So it has to start at the top, communicate it down to embrace the risk, embrace change, not have a zero defects mentality. But a lot of times it's lip sync <laughs> or, lip, you know, you just have these, these senior leaders like saying, hey, oh, it's OK if you make a mistake. And then you make a mistake and you lose X amount of money and all of a sudden you're fired. <laughs> Wait a second. 
I was doing exactly what you told me to do. Yeah, but you screwed up. Time to go. So I want to turn a little bit from leadership to try to understand lessons of resource allocation from the military. So there's resources of people. There are resources of weapons. There's resources of knowledge. As a leader in the military, how do you think about delegation and allocating resources? The Marine Corps has something, as we do our planning, that's referred to as the focus of effort. And it's a concept similar to prioritization. And basically it says, let's say we have three companies of Marines that are advancing. One company is designated as the focus of effort, which means that if you only have limited amounts of resources, whether it be artillery firing and support or naval gunfire or airplanes or any other aspect of what's happening on the battlefield, that the priority goes to that unit that has the, that is the focus of effort or wherever we must see success. And so other parts of the organization recognize that, hey, we may not get what we need at the time because we're the supporting effort. And this is really important to communicate that because a lot of times people are going to say, hey, why aren't I getting what I want? And we see certain individuals within the organization that have more influence or it's perceived that they have more influence. They're getting more assets. They're getting more computers. They're getting more people, whatever it is. And it's important that it's communicated that we're working as a team that the organization must succeed. And for the organization to succeed, this one group has our priority of effort. And like if it's in business development and you're seeing that, okay, we're going after you know, B2B corporate sale, like that's the priority, then everybody has to recognize that that's where we provide our support. And we see this a lot of times where if a new organization or a new division is being developed, a lot of times they're like, all right, we need some people for this. And all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, I, 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 these are my people. No, they're not your people. This is the organization's. And so a lot of times a poor leader who doesn't understand the greater perspective of the team succeeding will throw away one of their weakest performers. And so now all of a sudden you've got this, this focus of effort, this, this group that's supposed to be the greatest. All of a sudden you have a bunch of weak performers, and so it's, it's hamstringing their success – or the leaders just come around and say, all right, that's not happening. I'm taking your best. And so the key is to try and manage this and say, you know what? I've got two really great guys. I'm going to give one of my greatest guys over here because it's that important for success of the organization as a whole. And personally, it's it's going to hurt you, but it's important for the greater, greater good. So I think that's – hopefully that gives you some perspective on that. So I, I want to turn a little bit back to your personal story. So you – you know, we met in, in graduate school. You came out and went to work for Goldman Sachs. Let's start a little bit with what did you start to see in Goldman Sachs? It could be any organization, but in that particular organization where you're in this incredibly well-managed, leadership-trained organization, Goldman, which is probably one of the better organizations on Wall Street, but it's still Wall Street. What were your perceptions at the time of the good, the bad, and the ugly? <laughs> right. Well, look, I only spent a very short time with Goldman. And truth be told, I ended up punching out very quickly and ended up going to a high tech startup. And uh, the reason was Goldman, great organization, uh, super people, really brilliant people. Everything about it, I really uh, I didn't have anything bad to say about the organization as a whole or the people. But I having you know spent you know so much time in, in a combat environment. I saw myself more aligned with the entrepreneurial startups and really going into more of a, a an environment that was a little bit more volatile, uncertain, and complex and ambiguous. And and so I I, I didn't uh, I didn't stay at Goldman long. I ended up you know just did a quick summer associate and then bam I was out. But uh, I, I I don't really have anything bad to say about Goldman. And so you were in a high tech startup for a relatively short period of time, and nine uh, eleven hits. Right. And uh, it was interesting. It was actually I was in Israel uh, when uh, the the first blow, we should say, to the high tech world where I was working was the uh, Intifada in Israel, where all of a sudden I was in Jerusalem working with this high tech startup and 
<laughs> sort of like in a combat zone without a weapon. And it was a very bizarre situation. And all of the private investments dried up. And uh, shortly thereafter, you know, we end up seeing the Internet bubble. And this is just for pushback. This, two, this is you came out in 2000. So 2000, this is, right. Yeah. And uh, so I actually came back to the States and was working in the States when 9-11 happened just outside of New York when we were hit. And, you know, it, before the Pentagon was even hit, I immediately called up my old command who was out in California, 1st Marine Expeditionary Force, and talked to a duty officer. And I said, you know, get me back on active duty. And th- this was, you know, 630 in the morning, uh, their time, and they had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> I said, turn on the news. And they turned on news. And they said, stand by for orders and hung up. And then within a couple of months, uh, I was right back on active duty. And uh, within, you know, immediately, we, you know, I sort of, as a pres- class president, I immediately started going out and trying to identify, you know, who was in New York, who was injured, uh, who was, uh, if we had lost anyone, fortunately we hadn't, uh, although we had a lot of people in and around the site at the time. Um, and, uh, and then talked to a lot of the other uh, former service people. And, uh, you know, our class had, I think, about maybe 20 percent who had actually served and said, hey, guys, to, you know, time to head back. And everybody sort of laughed, like, come on, what, what, do you, what, what impact are we going to have? You know, we're, we're going to go back. We're going to be handing out volleyballs out at some base in the middle of the United States. You know, they're, they're not going to pick us. And so when all of a sudden I communicate with some of them from Afghanistan, they're like, seriously, <laughs> you're actually over there making a difference. And, uh, you know, and this is where, you know, you, you have to take that chance. Again, you have to do the right thing at the right time. And, and my perspective at the time was the Marine Corps was going to be, you know, spooling up. We were going to be bringing in a lot of subordinate, you know, junior enlisted and, and subordinate uh, officers. We were going to need field grade officers, whether it be majors, lieutenant colonels and colonels. And uh, I felt, again, the obligation, having had the training, the combat experience to go back and serve. So, so when did you retire then for the second time? It was uh, just before 2008. My daughter was on the way, and I decided, as much as I love being a Marine, that uh, being a father was going to be a greater challenge. <laughs> so uh, I retired to be a father. Great. And, and your most recent endeavor was a run for Congress. That's right. I'd love to hear about that process. I know you were campaigning with your 91-year-old mother, which was just a phenomenal thing to see from afar. What was, what was the process like? What did you learn? And again, let's, let's talk about some lessons of leadership and resource allocation. Now you're in a very different type of environment, limited budget, trying to get a lot done. And, uh, and how did that all unfold for you? Well, I'll tell you that you know, the, the, the first question everybody asks when you decide to run for Congress is, do you have the money? Will you have the money to get this done? And I, I don't think as a first time candidate, you realize the impact of the the money and how important that is. It, you know, it's really the ammunition to fight the fight. And th- those people who understand this game realize that the majority of your time really has to be on the phones begging for money. And it's a, uh, a, a painful process. And, uh, you know, fortunately, I had, uh, you know, people like yourself and others who were just very supportive and people who would, you know, contribute. I had classmates and section mates who were unbelievable in their support. And then other people just because of family circumstances, all the rest that just weren't able to. But then, you know, you're going out to, to everybody just, you know, really trying to gather your war chest before you get going. And, um, we, we had a lot of promises from big donors as well. And this election cycle was very interesting in that, you know, with, when people were watching who was running and what was happening, people would they would say, yes, we're coming behind you. Then next second, we're not putting a penny into any of these races. And it was just very bizarre from uh, from the financial standpoint. Uh, the, it's sort of there, there's two parts of it. There's the ground game and then there's the air war. The ground game we crushed. Uh, we were out five in the morning and <laughs> my, my mom was out there with me, my wife, my dog, my daughter. I mean, we had we had a blast going out early in the morning, welcoming people to the train stations, uh, really trying to shake as many hands as possible, communicate with as many people as possible. And, and it was really brand recognition, trying to get people to know who I was, uh, because most people didn't. And that was really the challenge. 
So that's where the the second piece is the air war. And the air war is getting on the radio waves, getting out there on television and making sure that you have television commercials. At the end of the game, uh, we crushed the, the ground war in that we did extremely well in areas that people thought we would gain no traction. Uh, I was running, I had uh, the support of five parties. I was uh, on the Republican ticket. I had the independent ticket, the conservative pit ticket, the tax revolt, and the reform line. We had five parties supporting us, and uh, we got 41% of the vote uh, compared to Trump, who got 37 in our district. So this was not a, a very you know, Republican-friendly district, but we crossed over the lines, and we met into other districts that we were told we would get absolutely no support. The challenge was we never had the funding to get up on the air. We didn't have the television commercials. We didn't have the communication to where our opponent that spent $3.5 million compared to our 400000 was able to communicate a lot better than we were and to get the word out to where on the day of the election, when I was out with big signs and shirts and everything and were shaking hands, some woman came out and said, you know, I, I just voted. And I, I voted Republican across the line, but I, who are you? <laughs> and I explained who I was, and she goes, oh, I, I didn't recognize your name, so I voted for your opponent. So here's somebody that should have voted for me but didn't know who I was, which is not acceptable. She could have come out and said, oh, I know who you are. I hate you. That's okay. At least you know who I am, but to not even know. And so people are like, wow, you did great, and you, you, know, you should be very proud. I explained to him, look, this is a binary effect. You either win or lose. There's no second-place medal. We lost, and, and I accept that. And, uh, but it was a great experience, and uh, it was one that, again, it was – I, I felt it was someone that was necessary and important to do. Yeah, well, I, I for one was not pleased to see that the outcome didn't turn out. And, you know, it's funny, I, I, you know, another one of our classmates, Terry Wilson, had run for comptroller of New York, and he's now, I guess, considering a run for governor and had the same experience. He was a Republican in New York running on a ticket where I don't remember the, the numbers in a, in, a, in a seat, the comptroller that nobody really knows anything about. And he did much, much better than the ticket did. This is when, I guess, when Cuomo won. But it's really, really hard and to, to overcome sort of, you know, a red and a blue state in that or blue district in that case. Very, very challenging. It's interesting because you, you have these these different polls that sort of tell you how each state will play out. And it's sort of like odd makers. And, uh, you know, going against the odds is really tough. And we were definitely going against the odds. I think we had like a five to one uh, Democrat to Republican uh, registered voters. And so, you know, people people didn't really think we would even get more than 20 percent of the vote. And so the, the sad thing was afterwards, large donors were saying, wow, we didn't realize how well you were going to do. The fact you got you could have actually won had we supported you. And that, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> and how do you think about the. The idea of, of putting your full self into something when you know at the beginning the odds of success are long against you. It's one of those things that it's the only way to play. That Number one, you, you, you can't do something, you know, half in. And this is many people, they, they do this half in and then their excuse is, well, you know, I, I really didn't try. And, you know, it was just I knew we were going to lose. That's not acceptable. You go in 100 percent or you don't play at all. And it's a lesson that I learned early on, uh, actually, as a, a little kid playing football in high school, where I came from, you know, a, a non-football world where, you know, Great Neck South, liberal New York, we, we were not a football school at all. And uh, we had a bunch of great kids and we were really enthusiastic and we loved each other. We were like brothers and we still are to this day. And early on, I said, you know what? When we're seniors, we're going to have an undefeated team. We're going to be number one. And my own team laughed in my face. And they said, look, we don't even have a quarterback. <laughs> and so I was like, good point. So I decided to be the quarterback. And I knew nothing about quarterback. I was a fullback. I was a guy who take the ball and just crash into the line. Well, by our senior year, we had an undefeated team. And we destroyed everybody by 30 points per game. And we weren't the fastest. We weren't the strongest. But we had the will. And that's where I learned early on that the, the will to win – that drive, the desire, and everybody giving 100%, really, that can dictate what's going to happen at the end of the day. And that's carried through into the Marine Corps where, as we're talking about that first Gulf War, as we were about to go into, I don't know if many people remember, the Kuwait was just this, this burning Hades. You had these burning oil wells, you had the smoke, 
you couldn't see daylight in the middle of the day because of all of the flame trenches they had set fire to. And we were told by the analyst who told the Marines, our lead unit, 1st Battalion, 6th Marines, they said, you will take 50% casualties. That means every other person was either going to be shot, killed, wounded, or something. And every Marine sat here and looked at each other and said, well, sucks to be you. <laughs> because the perspective was not going to happen to me. But the reality is we didn't even take but 1% casualties going through. And it, a lot of it is that will to win, the desire, and the focus. And competence breeds confidence. And uh, there, there is no choice. You can't. You can't do anything half speed. You have to go 100%. If you fail, you fail and accept it. How do you think about, you know, we were talking a little bit about this before. Some of these concepts of resilience through failure are, in some people, innate. And in others, they need the support to build up the, the strength to feel that they have the competence to have the confidence. For those people who it's just not innately, I'm just going to keep running through the brick wall until the brick wall goes down. How do you encourage those people? And we've also talked about it with our kids. Right? How do you support your kids when they're in those moments where they're not being resilient? Yeah, that's great. I, you know, I see that all the time with my daughter, and I'm constantly trying to reinforce those things. And she, she understands one concept, and that is we always try. And this is where, you know, as a matter of fact, this morning she just made her own macaroni and cheese for lunch, and I provided supervision from afar, but she did it herself, and I was very proud. And she was like, but, Dad, what do I do here? What do I Figure it out. And, you know, certainly, you know, you, we have to take that perspective from the leadership into our subordinates and where we have to encourage our subordinates to always try because too many times they come to us like, I, I have a problem. And, and they're not saying I have a problem. They're saying, here, you have a problem you have to fix for me. And it's important we push it back down and say, great, figure it out and tell me what you're going to do to solve it. And that's one of those things that too many times we, if we're good leaders or we perceive ourselves as good leaders, like I will save the day. And we end up detracting from what our responsibility is, which is the oversight of the organization, because we get focused on this individual task that we have to push down and we have to develop our subordinate leaders to have the resilience and to be problem solvers. And, you know, I guess, again, the, to take it back to the Marine Corps perspective, as the company commander in charge of 300 Marines, you may love shooting the machine gun. And you may be the best machine gun shooter. You could put the, all the rounds on target. But if you're down there shooting the machine gun, well, who's looking after leading the organization? And who's providing for the logistics and the food and the, the transportation and all of the aspects that are responsible? That's your job. And this is where you can't get bogged down in any one task. You have to develop your subordinates to be problem solvers. There's a really interesting aspect of in some organizations. I know there's some some new leadership uh, models that talk about that example. So the guy who's the great machine gun guy may ultimately not be the great manager of a group of machine gunners. Right. And so how do you think about, no, his passion is shooting machine guns. Before we promote him to be the manager of machine gunners, let's think about what's the right thing for him and the right thing for the organization as a whole. So in your experience, how do you decide when does someone when is someone in just the right seat? And so therefore they can stay in that seat. You can promote them. If it's a business, you can pay them more, but they keep doing the same thing because they love it and they're great at it. Or do you push them outside of that comfort zone to say, no, now you're going to be the manager of machine gunners. Let's see if you can do that too, because if you can, that'll be even more valuable. Ted, I, I think it's you know, you're hitting on something that's it's really near and dear to my own heart because I'm seeing a few close friends that they're in situations where they love what they do, and especially in the consulting world, and that because they are so good, they're now being elevated into positions where a lot more focus is on business development, which they hate. They just hate the business development aspect. Some people, it's just not their thing, but they're the best at whatever it is they do, whether it be auditing, whether it be strategic analysis, whatever it is. And it's our job as leaders to really put the best players in the right positions and recognize that 
you know what? There isn't a, cutty, a cookie cutter stamp for everybody. And not everybody's like, well, this is what you need for progression. And it's very tough within organizations that have this model bureaucracy. It says, well, this is what we do. And this is a part of our challenge as leaders to say, why? And, and the thing is, we, we fall prey to this, you know, well, that's the rules. And again, one of the things we, we learned in the Marine Corps is that the Marine Corps has all sorts of rules and standing operating procedures like this. And there's just, you know, you could find pretty much something to answer every single question. But the first thing you learn is that that all rules can be changed. There's a there is that flexibility for success. And again, it's the the peacetime bureaucracy versus the combat environment where you have to be you have to have that flexibility to recognize like yes, the rule is here, but we can make exceptions for whatever reason. Now, the exceptions, we have to be careful though that they shouldn't be based upon nepotism or other reasons that would ultimately destroy the morale of the organization. And we have to be careful of perceptions as well. But ultimately, if everybody understands like, hey, that person is the best at whatever it is, keep them there. So what's next for you? Well, right after the uh, the failure of the election, we were approached by uh, quite a few people that talked about getting me into the administration. And I was very excited about that. Had uh, people putting my resume in front of uh, a lot of key players within the transition team and was looking forward to working within the Department of Defense, uh, perhaps as an undersecretary or an assistant or a deputy assistant, uh, perhaps focused on special operations. And the reality is that the administration just has not appointed a lot of people into the Department of Defense. I think <laughs> General Mattis is the only person, the Secretary of Defense, and all the other seats are being held by acting personnel. And uh, so we're right now I'm, I'm consulting and uh, trying to help out other organizations as best I can, and we'll see how that plays out over the next couple of months. What's your sweet spot, just so people who are listening know, what's your sweet spot of the type of organizations you like working with? I, I really enjoy developing teams, uh, working with, uh, like right now there's an organization that I'm going to be uh, helping out where they, a lot of times organizations misunderstand their their business strategy versus their execution and that they'll dev- divine or develop to find a, a great business model based upon financial success, but the implementation and the execution with the personnel escapes them. And and it's because a lot of times when people who are are in the the, the financial world, they're great crunching the numbers and building out the pro formas. The execution piece is the challenging part. And so I'm coming in to help build out world-class teams to actually facilitate success for these different organizations that do have great business models. And that's really, I would say, uh, where I've been able to add the greatest value. All right, let's turn to some closing questions. What is your favorite thing to do that is a complete waste of time? Huh. Well, my favorite thing to do that I, I guess depends on how you define it as a complete waste of time is just playing with my daughter. And um, I would say it's not a waste of time because you know, I've got a great relationship with my daughter. But I, like yesterday, my daughter wanted to figure out how to make slime. So we went online and we figured out how to make slime. And uh, she loved it. The fact that she actually created this thing was an amazing. But I remember as we were doing this, like, oh, my gosh, this is wasting so much time. And the reality is it wasn't. And so I think in general, whenever you do something with someone else, it's not a waste of time. I think doing things by yourself, uh, if you're not developing yourself, reading or something like that, that is a waste of time. So I try to always do things with my daughter so I'm not wasting time. It's an excuse for not wasting time. My wife will say we're wasting time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what was your favorite sports moment, either as a participant or an observer? Uh, I guess that, that had to be our senior year in high school, uh, being the quarterback of an undefeated football team. And I remember our coach pulling us together, and we had this on video. And, you know, we're all jumping around cheering, and we're all happy. And he pulled us together, and he said something that was very insightful that I don't think really sunk in at the time. And he said, savor this moment because you may never have one like this again. And I think, you know, as an 18, 17, 18-year-old kid, you, you don't realize that great success doesn't happen all the time. And, you know, I was very fortunate that I've gone on. I've been a part of great teams. But I know there's a lot of kids on our football team. Like, that was the highlight of their life. Those are glory days. And um, 
So I, that was the, you know, definitely the greatest sports moment of my life. And I, I love that one. And I love, you know, re, reuniting with uh, old classmates and, you know, reliving the glory days. Absolutely. What phrase that your mother or father repeated to you over and over again has most stuck with you? Well, I guess there, there's two. And uh, one we hit upon, which is the is noblesse oblige, which is, you know, if you have the ability, you have an obligation to use that ability to help others. The other is you've got to pay the price. And this is one that my father, you know, who, again, he went on to be an NIT championship captain, an NIT championship basketball team. And it was something that was taught to him by his coach, Claire B, is that, you know, success doesn't come easily. You have to pay the price, whether that means working extra hours, whether that means, you know, giving up something else that you like. You know, self-discipline is just about pushing those things away that you might want now for something greater that you want later. And that's that's something that whenever things get tough, I remember my father saying, hey, you have to pay the price. And it, it anything that's worthwhile is not going to come easy. And we too many times we see success. We're like, oh, my gosh, that guy is so lucky. That gal is so lucky. Nobody's lucky that they haven't set themselves up for luck. And there's been plenty of failures and there's been a, plenty of hard work. Whenever someone else is going to sleep, someone else is staying awake and working an extra hour. So that's that's where I'd say those are the two. Noblesse oblige and you've got to pay the price. What's your favorite book? Well, that's a good question. My favorite book, you know, I'm reading a lot of political stuff right now, and I just reread The Clash of Cultures, which is, you know, one of those things that's really perspective, give me a lot of perspective on what's happening right now in the East versus West world. And business book, I would say Good to Great. Love that. And I would also say I love reading the Bible. I think you can go back and find plenty of insightful stories there and you can even take it further and and say reading the talmud and uh, what's very interesting is that you can go out and you can the the talmud right now is like one of the number one read books in korea they actually have as a part of their standard education there's not many jews there however the perspective is that there's such great insight and the same in china as well and uh, so the you know you can find insight in books that you wouldn't that will help in life uh, certainly, they or in business that you wouldn't necessarily perceive. That's fantastic. What do you know now that you wish you knew ten years ago? Well, we'll, we'll take it on a, that personal relationships impact uh, business significantly, and uh, I made some some calls personally about ten years ago uh, that have that impacted my life significantly. And I, without going into great details, I destroyed my marriage. And it was uh, by self, self, selfish acts that I perceived as uh, victimless crimes that had tremendous impact. And uh, it left me as uh, a single father trying to raise a daughter. And uh, by, by learning from that and recognizing the, the, you know, the sanctity of life and recognizing the importance of relationships and valuing those things which are most important – and valuing, valuing uh, where you spend your time, I think that recognizing the importance of picking the, uh, the right partner in life is so important. So I'm, I'm married to an amazing woman right now, Beth, who, uh, I mean, just incredible in every single aspect of uh, my life. And I, you know, I, I go out of my way to try and be supportive of her. So I think the, you know, the guidance that I would share with, with my daughter and I share with other people is, you know, make sure you pick your partner right. Pick the right friend. All right, last one. It's your waning days. You're about 98 years old, sitting in a rocking chair. Don't have the energy to restrain Jack Nicholson. <laughs> what advice would you give yourself today? Do it all over again. <laughs> I, uh, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's been an amazing, amazing ride. Uh, the importance of friendships of networks uh that's uh to me the most important thing and it's uh, again to give a short story here i had a roommate academic honor graduate from the naval academy brilliant super person uh who went on to go to stanford to get his mba and when i was thinking about getting out of the marine corps the first time he convinced me to go get my mba and 
really didn't know what that meant at the time, but it was sound guidance. And he gave further guidance, which was even more insightful. He said, when you go, the most important thing is going to be developing your relationships and developing your networks and making sure that you have people that you can rely upon throughout your career. He said, the academics, you'll pick up. But he went to Stanford to be the academic honor graduate because that's sort of the, the, the rule of thumb in the Marine Corps is that where, whatever school you go to, you should be number one, especially if you go to another service component. If you go to an Army school, you should certainly be the honor graduate from the Army school. And uh, he tried to do it, and he failed. Uh, he fell short. He still did very well. But he said he failed worse than not becoming the academic honor graduate in that he spent all of his time studying academically by himself And he didn't build the networks and he didn't build those relationships to where after he had certain challenges in his career, he didn't have people to turn to. And he actually helped. He had to tack into the networks that I had developed. But it was because he told me to focus on that, to marry that up with when we were first the first day at Harvard Business School, one of the former deans came in and he asked, what are the what do you think the most important number is that you should focus on while you're here at business school. And of course, people are like, oh, ones, we should all focus on getting ones, the best grades, and no, wrong. Well, well, threes and fours, we don't get those, those are bad grades. No, wrong. And oh, the the top 10%, and then, no, no, you're all wrong, you're all wrong. And he said six. We're like, six? What the heck six mean? And he went on to tell a story about how his section was an extremely close section of 80 people and they would celebrate everybody's birthday. And if there was a choice, you know, do we study extra for the test or do we go out, celebrate this anniversary or birthday? They would always go and celebrate the anniversary and the birthday. And, and there was just, there was a focus on people first and constantly building this relationship. And to this day that they get together every other year for a reunion, their section. And sometimes the reunions in New Jersey and sometimes it's in Fiji, but wherever it is, They make sure that every single person attends. And so some people who have done really well financially on Wall Street subsidize those people who perhaps went and did more social work or did more academic type work to make sure that not only does every person attend, but their spouse and their children, everybody attends these amazing reunions, all but six. And he said there were six people in his section that never participated in any of the socializing, they focus purely on themselves, purely on academics, purely on making sure that they were the Baker scholars. And those six are never invited to any of their reunions. So I would say the, the long story short is that focus on the relationships, build the relationships, make sure they're meaningful relationships. And in the end of the day, that's really what's going to be most important. Bull, I am so glad that we did this. I am so glad to be included in your network of relationships, and I'm so excited to see what will come next for you and next after that and next after that and on and on and on. So thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, it's an honor. Thanks so much. I appreciate you including me. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you've liked what you've heard, please write a review on iTunes or Google Play to help others find out about the show. Have a good one, and see you next time.